Our next topic is ratios and proportions. Ratios and proportions are introduced for the first time in the seventh grade in the Common Core State Standards and it's kind of a, a natural place for it to be because by seventh grade students are expected to be proficient in their understanding of fractions. So by seventh grade they're ready to start to apply those fractions to other problems and ratios and proportions are a natural progression for the application of fractions. So a ratio is a comparison of two quantities and it's actually a comparison of two quantities by division, although we don't always see that division explicitly in the way the ratio is expressed. Let's imagine that we've got three squares and two circles and we want to make a comparison between the numbers of squares and the numbers of circles. So we could write a ratio comparing the number of squares to the number of circles in three ways. We could use the word two. Since there are three squares and two circles, we could say that the ratio is three to two. We could also use a colon to express that comparison and we would pronounce this exactly the same way. We would say three to two. And we, we can express a ratio as a fraction. And in this case, even though the fraction looks like the fraction three halves, if we're going to be calling this a ratio, we would probably still say three to two. Now for our purposes, we're going to be writing our ratios as fractions because we'll be doing some mathematical operations with them. If you have two ratios that are equal, then they form what we call a proportion. So if we go back to our squares and our circles, we can think about comparing the squares to the circles or we could compare the circles to the squares. The order that we compare these things in is important because ratios have an implied ordering about them. So if we compare the number of circles to squares, we would say that the ratio is two to three. Now suppose we double the number of circles and we double the number of squares. In that case we would have four circles compared to six squares. Those two ratios are equal to each other, so they form a proportion. And if you look at those fractions, you'll look at something that looks pretty familiar. We've already talked about how we can tell that two fractions represent the same quantity. So we already know that two-thirds equals four-sixths. Here's a third grade item from the MAP test. It's a sample item and it's asking students to complete a table showing the number of students that can ride on a certain number of boats. Now we've looked at problems like this in terms of completing a pattern, but there also are some ratios involved in a table like this. For example, we could compare the number of boats to the number of students and say that the ratio one to three or one third represents that comparison for one boat and three students. And two to six is a ratio that compares two boats to six students and four to 12 is a ratio that compares four boats to 12 students. So if we look at a problem like this as representing ratios, then we could simply complete the ratios and come up with equal fractions to the fractions that we've already seen. So three ninths, three to nine, or five to 15, or six to 18, or seven to 21, would all be equal ratios to the ones that we were given. Here's another uh, sample item, for, and this one's from the PARC field test. PARC is one of the Common Core consortia. Um, the other one is Smarter Balanced. And this is a sample item comparing brass instrument players to percussion instrument players in a band. Now we're gonna come back to this question in just a little bit, but let's talk about solving proportions first. 
Now since a proportion represents two equal ratios, and we can think of those ratios as fractions, then solving proportions can be done by using some of the same techniques we've already talked about in terms of looking at ways to find out whether or not fractions are equivalent. And one of those ways was to look to see if there was a multiplier, a scale factor, that would allow us to see a relationship between the two fractions. So in this case, if we look at the 4 and the 12 in the denominators, we can see that 4 times 3 is 12. So we know that 3 times 3 would have to equal n, which means n would have to equal 9. But not all proportions have nice multipliers. When I look at the 7 and the 6 in the denominators of these fractions in this proportion, I can't see an easy multiplier to get from 7 to 6. So if I don't see an easy multiplier, if I don't see an easy scale factor, then cross multiplying is going to be a way to find that missing value. Now remember we've seen cross multiplying before. We know that if we uh, cross multiply with two fractions and the cross products are equal, then the fractions must be equal. So we're using that same property here. So we could say that the 5 times 6, which is 30, has to equal the 7 times n, which is 7n. And if 7n equals 30, then n would be 30 sevenths, or 4n 2 sevenths. So let's go back to this uh, field test sample item. Uh, what we're comparing here is the number of brass instrument players to the number of percussion instrument players in a band. And I know that that's the comparison that's being made because of the uh, the question that's being asked at the bottom. It says, Mr. Ruiz re realizes that there are blank brass instrument players per percussion player. So those are the two things we're comparing, brass players and percussion players. So let's take the values that we've been given for the three bands and see if we can make those comparisons. So for band one, we know that there's 123 brass players for every 41 percussion players. And what I want to know is how many brass players there are per one percussion player. So I can set up a proportion that I can solve by cross multiplying and I find out that there are three brass instrument players per percussion player. Now if you look at the numbers for the other two bands, you may notice that that proportion is exactly the same for the other two bands as well. In fact, it's the most obvious to see if you look at band 3, where there's 150 brass players to uh, uh, 50 percussion players. And if we solve that proportion, we get exactly the same value, 3. So that tells us that that relationship between brass instrument players and percussion instrument players is identical in the two bands because when we found this missing value in the proportion comparing the number of brass instrument players to one percussion player, we got the same value. So there's a really interesting book that, it, this one is, has been out for a very long time, uh, that has a lot of information about um, how people do things and um, it's a good resource for coming up with some just some interesting real life numbers that you can do to make comparisons. So we're going to look at one of the little pieces of information out of that book. Uh, the book says that three out of every ten adults segregate their food. Now if you don't know what a, a food segregator is, then you probably aren't one. Uh, a food segregator is a person who likes to keep all the food on their plate separate. They don't like any of it touching any other food. In fact, they, a food segregator would probably be happy if we lived in a world where all plates were divided plates. Uh, so three out of 10 adults are food segregators. Now we're going to write that information as a ratio first. So we're comparing food segregators to 10 adults, so that would be to 10 total adults. So as a ratio, we could write that as 3 to 10. 
So if we have a group of 90 people, how many would you expect to be food segregators? Our ratio is comparing segregators to total people. And we know that there are three food segregators for every 10 total people. We have a group of 90 total people and we want to know how many are food segregators. So we're comparing segregators that we don't know, that's the X, to the 90 total. And now we've got a proportion we can solve. So in this case we do have an easy multiplier. 10 times 9 is 90 and 3 times 9 is 27. So that means in a group of 90 people we would expect there to be 27 food segregators. Now remember if you can't see that easy multiplier you can always cross multiply to get that same result. So let's look at a seventh grade math task from achievethecore.org. It says the students in Ms. Baca's art class were mixing yellow and blue paint. She told them that two mixtures will be the same shade of green if the blue and yellow paint are in the same ratio. So we've got a table that shows different mixtures of paint uh, that five different students made. So the students are student A and B and C and D and E. So we're going to go through these questions one at a time and see how we can use ratios and proportions to solve the question. So the first question is how many different shades of paint did the students make? So we're going to figure out what the ratio of yellow paint to blue paint is for each of these students. So starting with student A, student A used half a cup of yellow paint and three-fourths of a cup of blue paint. Now we'd probably like to see a ratio written as a fraction that has integers in the numerator and denominator. So we're going to do something to eliminate the decimals, like multiply numerator and denominator by 100. And then if we simplify that fraction by dividing numerator and denominator by 25, we get the fraction 2 thirds. So student A used 2 cups of yellow paint for every 3 cups of blue paint. Student B used one cup of yellow paint to two cups of blue paint, and that's as simplified as we can get it. And that definitely is not the same as what student A used. Student A used two cups of yellow to three cups of blue. Student C used one and a half cups of yellow to three cups of blue. If we multiply numerator and denominator by 10, and then divide numerator and denominator by 15, we see that the ratio of yellow paint to blue paint for student C was 1 to 2, and that's identical to the ratio that student B used. So B and C have the same shade of paint. Student D has a ratio of 2 to 3 for yellow to blue, which is identical to what student A had. And student E has a ratio of 3 to 4.5. We could multiply numerator and denominator by 10 and then divide numerator and denominator by 15 to get a ratio of 2 to 3. So now we can see how many different shades of paint we have. Students A, D, and E have a ratio of 2 cups of yellow paint to 3 cups of blue paint and students B and C have a ratio of one cup of yellow paint to two cups of blue paint. So there are two different shades. Part B says which, which mixtures make the same shade as mixture A. And we've actually already done all the work for that. Um, mixtures D and E have exactly the same ratio of yellow to blue as mixture A. So they would also have the same shade. Part C asks how many cups of yellow paint would a student add to one cup of blue paint to make a mixture that's the same shade as mixture A? So we're comparing yellow paint to blue paint and we know that mixture A has two cups of yellow to three cups of blue. 
The question is, how many cups of yellow would we need to add to one cup of blue? So we're comparing the ratio 2 to 3 to the ratio x to 1. And if we cross multiply and solve, we get x equals 2 thirds of a cup. So we need 2 thirds of a cup of yellow paint for every 1 cup of blue paint. And now question D. It's the most generalized question we have here. Let B represent the number of cups of blue paint and Y represent the number of cups of yellow paint in a paint mixture. Write an equation that shows the relationship between the number of cups of yellow paint Y and the number of cups of blue paint B in mixture E. So if you look at the ratio of yellow to blue for mixture E, that was 2 to 3. So that ratio 2 to 3 would have to be equal to the number of cups of yellow paint compared to the number of cups of blue paint, Y to B. So we actually have an equation that shows the relationship. Now we could write that equation in other ways. We could cross multiply and we have yet another equation that shows the relationship between yellow paint and blue paint in mixture E. Or we could solve for one of those variables and we could say that Y equals two-thirds B. So in other words, the number of cups of yellow paint is two-thirds of the number of cups of blue paint. Now another way you'll, you'll see ratios and proportions used is with scales on a map. So in this case the scale on a map is 1 inch equals 20 miles. So 1 inch on our paper map is equal to 20 miles in the real world. If two towns are 4 and a half inches apart on the map, how many miles apart are they? So we have a comparison here of inches on the map to miles in the real world. And if we write some ratios comparing those two things, we know that one inch on the map is 20 miles in the real world. And we know that four and a half inches on the map is some unknown number of miles. Now we've got a proportion we can solve. So if we cross multiply, we get one X equals 20 times four and a half. Well, 20 times 4 and a half, let's see, 4 and a half is 9 halves, so 1x or x equals 20 times 9 halves, which is 180 halves, which is 90. So the two towns are 90 miles apart. How about if we know that two towns are 75 miles apart? How far apart will they be on the map? we have this same ratio that compares inches on the map to miles in the real world. We know that one inch is equal to 20 miles. We also know that these two towns are 75 miles apart, but we don't know how many inches apart they are. So the x inches that we don't know compares to the 75 miles that we do know. If we cross multiply, then we know that 20x would have to equal 75, which means that x is 75 twentieths, which is 3 and 3 fourths. So the two towns will be 3 and 3 fourths inches apart on the map. So that's the end of our discussion of ratios and proportions, and we'll practice a few of these in class.